Hi, I'm George Lewis, uh, composer, professor of music at Columbia University in historical musicology and composition, and uh, longtime uh, researcher and, and performer, composer, and uh, programmer in certain kinds of AI-related enterprises, among other things. My interest in real-time uh, experience has always been at the heart of my interest in machine intelligence and AI and machine learning. Um, that's been true ever since I first decided that I could think about trying to make machines that quote improvise. And I remember being at a party where um, a guy came up and said, well, um, do you think, George, you could uh, get a, a computer to improvise? And at that time, I hadn't even programmed a computer, but I started telling him how easy it was. And all he said was, um, well, you should try it. And then he went off and uh, the guy said, you were just talking to Marvin Minsky. What, you got, what were you guys talking about? I said, I was. <laughs> <laughs> but then it turned out that that was part of a community because in, he, in fact he was thinking about those questions and it was a great inspiration to, to be around somebody over the years who thought deeply about improvisation with, uh, in artificial intelligence, thought they were very important. So for me, um, this kind of work has larger societal implications. You've got, for example, the uh, malign face recognition doodads that think all black people are criminals, you know, or you've got the self-driving cars that can't recognize certain things. These are real-time improvisation problems. So that I think that maybe the people who build these things could probably benefit from talking to artists, talking to improvisers about what they think, because any kind of driving is basically an improvisation problem. So improvisation has been for me at the center of being able to think about machine learning in all its aspects. And that's why a place like PRISM that's open to that kind of thinking uh, becomes a place where we can really think on a high level about it. I have been working with PRISM for uh, over a year, about a year and a half, and the aim of this project is to, well, let's put it this way. I've already been working with a, a project that I've made since the early 19, late 1980s called Voyager, and before that there was a piece called Rainbow Family, but the idea was the same, to have a, a kind of virtual orchestra, a virtual performer that improvises, or uh, in this sense, when you're generating music, the machine doesn't really know if it's improvising or composing. So that's really a political and ideological decision. But if I make it an improviser, that means that I'm obliged to have it respond to real-time conditions, and rather than being something that doesn't respond. I wanted to uh, extend the capabilities of Voyager. Voyager can always do, already do a lot. It can play with bands and orchestras and things like that and make a good account of itself, hold its own. But there's certain things it doesn't hear well. And so what I'm doing at PRISM is we're making a kind of real-time recognizer, sort of like the face recognition things or the things that sit on self-driving cars, another interesting improvisation problem as I see it. And so the purpose of this is to be able to hear certain gestures that we've set up in advance, that we've trained the system on, and that in performance, when it hears these things, it can make responses. And there's certain kind of things that are harder to hear with Voyager's current recognizers that this thing is designed to, uh, to ameliorate. The new work is called Forager because that is basically what the machine is doing. Now that Voyager has this interesting front end that can recognize certain gestures in a way that its own recognizers cannot do, it enables it to go through the real-time musical environment of people improvising, looking for gems, looking for gestures that it can recognize, looking for things to sort of hang its musical hat on, and then things to which these uh, larger Voyager piano system can respond. So it makes it, it allows the system to be more integrated with what the other musicians are doing. They're also improvising and foraging. Improvising and foraging have a certain real-time connection. In fact, I think foraging is a form of improvisation. So they're all performing together. At the beginning of the piece, they have a set of written, they have some written music that they perform. This music um, embodies the gestures that the system is supposedly recognizing. Then during the, the middle of the piece, 
people start using these gestures to make their performances. Um, they don't have to play them. They don't have to make up, you know, things out of nothing. They can use the use what I'm calling databases. Everyone has a, a database page which represents all the gestures and verses on them that the system is trained to recognize on. Of course, they're not limited to these gestures. They can do whatever they like. When the system recognizes one of these gestures, or when they recognize some of them, they can also make responses. That's, in a nutshell, how the piece will work. We don't know where it's going to go. Lots of things can happen. But we're hoping, as with a lot of these pieces that involve improvisation, that the introduction of uh, a set of gestures that they can uh, have in common allows for a sense of unity of conception to emerge among the players. When I first heard about PRISM from Emily Howard, I thought this would be an ideal place to realize uh, my new work and also other kinds of new works, in particular uh, the work we're doing with uh, Julia Highland Bruno on virtual birds, which is a sound project but not a music project. And what we're hoping to figure out by using machine learning techniques, we've already built, me and my associate Damon Holsborn, who is here now in Manchester with us working on it, we've already built a virtual zebra finch that can generate zebra finch samples in real time and sort of sound like a real bird. So now we, we want to know whether the birds think it's a real bird. And for that, we need uh, some sort of machine recognizing system. It won't help us just to, to record a corpus of bird sounds and then play it back. That doesn't help us at all. What we need is something where the birds can dialogue because that's what they do. Um, so the PRISM is the ideal place to do something like that as well because people are thinking about music in a most expansive way. I mean, I've learned a great deal from working with Chris Mellon and David Aurora, Bofan Ma, um, and, um, and, and Emily, as, Emily Howard as well. So it seems to me that this is an ideal spot for musicians and artists and composers and technologists to come together. And it's being part of the RMC, RNCM is most important because that's the, that's the uh, framework in which the whole thing sits. So you get, you get a larger community of artists working together to do innovative and important things that relate to sound, music, and society. I have a lot of plans for PRISM. I don't know what plans PRISM has for me. <laughs> But uh, I can think of at least three projects. We've already talked about the Virtual Bird project, but there are, there are other projects, uh, compositional projects, where I'd really like to continue my association with PRISM because there's really nowhere else like it. I feel that the openness, the, the brain trust, uh, the association with the RNCM and the possibility of working with musicians, uh, live musicians as well, um, the, the technological facilities, um, and the uh, congeniality of the place. Um, end up being very important for me in terms of the kind of place which I feel that's the kind of environment we need in the future to uh, do things successfully and I hope that um, I hope that happens.